Five months after a final interview visit to LaForche and Terrebonne Parishes in Louisiana, I found myself sitting in a coffee shop perusing notes for the construction of this one act. If anything was learned during my year of interviews there, it was that the issues of wetland loss in the region was unbelievably complicated, made more profound by the deep emotional and cultural connection between the people and their region. The key facts are simple. The South Louisiana wetlands are disappearing at a profound rate. Every hour, a football field size of land is lost to the forever to the Gulf of Mexico a process unarguably connected to man-made activity and industry. As a result, the people of the South Louisiana are losing their land, their homes, their communities, their economies, and in some cases, their lives. As concrete as these facts are, the causes and potential solutions are extraordinarily complicated, clouded amidst variations in environmental outlook and a whirlwind of finger-pointing, corporate agendas, economic allegiances, and political mudslinging. In light of the horrific human errors that cause this mess, do we chalk it up to a learning experience and move onward? Why save this land? And why save these cultures? And who is the antagonist? Is it all of us? Everyone who uses oil and petroleum products. Everyone who eats Gulf seafood. Me? Or you? The government. Corporate America. How do I possibly write a play on socio-environmental issues that aren't even resolvable in my own mind? I sat in the coffee shop surrounded by research documents and interview notes that detailed hundreds of stories of struggle and survival. I looked down and noted an unfamiliar piece of paper protruding from a folder. It was lined. The phrase still attached from a spiral notebook. In the top left corner, the word social studies had been scratched out. Below that written in bubble teenage print was a letter. It read, I'm sorry I didn't speak to you when you talked to our class. Sometimes I feel like if I open my mouth, I'll cry, scream, or both. So I just stay quiet. Thank you for asking us how we're doing. No one asks. Things are bad. We're not well. And please make people understand that we are not stupid. We're really nice people. Maybe they don't understand what's happening, and that's why they don't help, right? Please give people the help. And also, can I be your play? Part six. I remembered her vividly from a visit to a high school in La Force Parish. Her teacher said she was working on a new children's adaptation of Longfellow's Evangeline. Only vaguely familiar with the story, I picked up a copy and discovered that Evangeline is an epic poem about two young Acadian lovers torn apart by the unjust consequences of cultural and social politics. Cece. A shy junior sitting in the back corner of the room, wearing a rainbow t-shirt, and not one word said during my discussion with her class. Her letter, however, offered a timely reminder of the voices that are being lost in this socio-environmental crisis we've caused for ourselves. Those of our children, our youth. It is these voices which may just literally hold the future of the world in their hands. This play is their story, not mine. Thank you, Cece. And you are in the play, Act 1, Scene 2. There was a young writer named Celia. Once upon a time, in a wetland, proudly dying, there are seven great parts that live there. Jackie, son and grandson known as medical musicians, and future CEO of Sony Entertainment. Drew, daughter of oil executive, self-described anarchist. Chad, son of a military man, deployed for duty in June. Sonia, hospital volunteer, called Mother Teresa by friends. Roxanne, head of the drama club. Savior of all things four legged. Thoreau, son of a scientist at the Hurricane Research Center, born in Michigan but reborn in Miami. And Tice, a budding photojournalist. Can you all give me a sense of what it's like to grow up here? Do you want the glossy color version or the messed up black and white? Nothing black and white. Nothing. I want to know what you want me to know. Don't be sure. You really want these can of worms? Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, snap. <laughs> Folgers coffee came about to open up. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a boy. <laughs> no, I'm not. But you know who is? Joe. Do you know who Joe is? Come on now, I know you know Joe. I dated Joe. Mama! <laughs> Can I use that? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. OMG. Please help us. <laughs> OK, well, um. How would you describe this place to someone who's never stepped foot here? Well, what's your connection to this place? Your history, in spite of and maybe because of your current situation? It's okay, give me something. You won't find better people who powder, most of the time. Or oh, people that know how to party better. Yeah. Woo! Mm. 
And you won't talk about the people? You can't talk about the value without talking about the people. True, true. true. This is what's paradise. That's such a crush. Stop being disrespectful. Yeah, yeah whatever. whatever. Sorry. No, it's okay, actually. Moving on. The wetlands are like, like, I don't know, special. No, 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 no. You're a <laughs> Objectively, because we're a part of them. 
It's environmental, it's social, it's political, it's all of it. The causes are obvious, it's the solutions. It's getting people to take responsibility, which isn't happening. Getting it paid for, which isn't happening. And getting the government to help fix it, which definitely isn't happening. Honestly, I think the only thing we have to do is to unchanalyze the river and get the heck out of here. As a storm approached, we came clear to the residents of the village, then likely future lay before all who remained. With no communication possible, Gabriel and Evangeline were left with no choice but to leave with their families and trust that they'd be together soon. Gabriel's desperate attempt to reach Evangeline was interrupted by vigilant parents fearing for the life of their son. Evangeline also protested her departure without Gabriel and followed the trustful wisdom, trustful wisdom of her father and began to travel north. And then the hurricane suddenly. Please evacuate the region. I repeat, please evacuate the region. He was tired. 
no words for it. Hell can't be worse. It put my whole identity in the question. I mean, I still love my country. I'm still ready to serve and lay down my life if necessary. I still believe in this country's core, its values, and its purpose as a world leader. But after the hurricane, I couldn't believe how the government had let us down. And it's still letting us down. It made a lot of things clear for me. I was suddenly embarrassed that I had gone to bat in defense of this government's values. But for what? For government is still leaving these people in need? I want national pride on my sleeve like a badge of honor. My father was a soldier, and so was my grandfather. I believe there are people in this country that still need us. And at the end, the core values that created this country, every single citizen would matter again. Yeah, whatever, I pray. That night it hit. The whole house shook, water starts pouring, the roof was caving, windows were blown out, the front door ripped off, looped through the wall into the hall where we were hiding. It was like, like every girl hard, the original, not the piece of crap we made. We located my uncle in a hospital in Florida a few weeks after the storm. We would have died for sure if we had stayed. I had a lot of time to think and reflect while I was in Texas. Every once in a while I watched TV until it ticked me off too much. It made me keep thinking, why are we talking about wars overseas? Why are we there? Why are we spending billions of dollars fighting the war over there when we have a war going on in our own country? What those billions of dollars could do here? They could prevent the whole situation from happening if they were used to fix the situation here before the hurricane. The real war is here. The old tier two, if that's what you're after. But it doesn't matter, though. The government is too busy playing chess in East Carolina's own people dying here. A long time after the hurricane, the government played the whole this could have been anticipated game. Study after study had been published showing the relationship between wetlands disintegration land loss, potential levy failures, and the relative loss of thousands of lives in the event of a Category 4 or 5. If you go back and read the reports, it almost sounds like a prophecy. All of it came true. Everything. The court and the government had this information for years. It did nothing. Then the goal to deceive the public and act like it's all a big surprise? Then to start finger pointing? The worst part about it is, is their failure to take any responsibility whatsoever or to even issue the smallest apology. I don't know what it'll take to begin mending. The scientific solutions are present. We'll never get them, though, until some responsibility is taken. Uh, I, I just can't talk about the personal stuff, though. I hope that's OK. You know, the idea of a mandatory evacuation is cool. Like, how can you make something mandatory if not everyone has the money to do it? We have no choice but to stay. This school, though, ended up being one of the best times of my life, really. Stuck in a, stuck in a half attic with five people, no dogs, no food, no water. Your whole life flooded two feet beneath me. Hoping not watch your grandfather die in front of you. Watching your mom go nuts. Having to leave the dog behind. Staying in four different shelters over the course of the next two months. No, it was cool. It was really fun. In fact, we're actually rich, and we thought it would be one day on each other. They, I just kept shooting and shooting and shooting. It was like my defense mechanism, I guess. I don't know. My family and I relocated, had relocated to Baton Rouge, which had its own problems, but nothing like the devastation in the bayou. While I was there, I maneuvered my way into helping other local film crew. Things were so chaotic, so crazy, that I don't realize, I don't know, that if they didn't realize that I didn't really belong, or they just didn't care, I don't know. While I was there, they got a hold of a media helicopter somehow, and I happened to be there at the right time, and they let me on. And we flew right into the heart of the devastation. My God, I can't. I knew it was bad, but I couldn't have been prepared for it. People on rooftops, people, people dead. A lot were calling to us, screaming, totally desperate. They just wanted help. I don't know. The weird thing is, like I said, you as a photographer spent.
of your life, trying to frame a moment to capture its essence. The situation, they were already framed. Each moment, everybody trying to hold on to an essence just to hold on. I can't look at those pictures yet. I'm not ready to. It didn't have to happen. None of it did. That's, That's the, the thing. thing. It, didn't it didn't have, have to happen. happen. Attention, this is a hurricane education alert. This is a hurricane. Shut up! What would you do if your hometown and its people were under immediate threat? What if you lost your land, your home, your family belongings, and no one seemed to care, much less lend a hand? What if the youth in your community fled without option as their culture decayed in their way? What if the lives of your grandparents or neighbors were unnecessarily lost while politicians seemed incapacitated and outsiders idly observed? What if all of this was avoidable, occurring because of man-made problems? What would you do? Yet he who believes in affection, that hopes and endures and is patient, patient, yet she who believes in resilience and beauty of love, List to this tradition still sung by the children of this land. List to this tradition of youth and hope in Acadie, home of the brave. We are, we are all, all Evangeline. And we love planted a new seed of hope in the village. Once upon a time. Um.